thank you very much for the invitation, first of all, to present some of our recent work. Um, I've really enjoyed the meeting so far, and hopefully I won't bore you too much with talking about stinging nettles. You'll note that I've slightly changed the talk of my title to mix it up a little bit. Um, also, thank you to the, the preceding speakers who've already given a lot of the background, so I can skip right to the point. Um, of course, this is not working. Let's see. No, got it. Thank you. All right, so um, first of all, I wanted to start with um, defining what venoms are, and that's because my group is mostly interested in understanding the pharmacology of venom peptides. And so if you look um, in a textbook or on Google, uh, venom is typically defined as a secretion containing one or more toxins produced by an animal and typically injected into prey or aggressors by biting or stinging. And of course, if you think of venoms, usually you think of venomous animals like cone snails, um, snakes, so you've already heard about centipedes earlier today, but hopefully at the end of today's talk I'll have convinced you that there's also venomous um, plants. Uh, so one family of plants that um, you'll all be familiar with are stinging nettles. Uh, they're found worldwide and um, here in Europe, of course, you um, would almost certainly have come across Odica dioca, the common European stinging nettle. In New Zealand, uh, the equivalent is Urtica ferox, or the onga onga, which I'll tell you a little bit about as well today. And in Australia, we're blessed by having uh, a family of particularly notorious stinging nettles um, belonging to the dendronite family. Um, and they're also called the gimpy gimpy, uh, named, well, the town gimpy in Australia is named after the plants, not the other way around. And um, I'll be telling you quite a bit about those today. So how do stinging nettles cause pain? Um, the leaves and stems of these plants are covered in these um, needle-like structures called trichomes. They are usually filled with a bioactive fluid. And if you look very carefully at the um, picture here, you can see there's a tiny little bulb at the top. It's actually that bit of the, the um, trichome that breaks off. Um, and then the, um, the needle can penetrate your skin to deliver a bioactive um, fluid, which almost invariably will cause pain. Uh, and the mechanisms by which these stinging nettles cause pain has been researched for almost many hundreds of years now. Uh, and any textbook, and even some members in the audience will tell you that it's because of small molecule neurotransmitters, including acetylcholine, um, 5-HT or serotonin, and, and histamine. Um, without going into too much detail about why that cannot be the complete story, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at saying that um, those small molecule neurotransmitters are really uh, not able to fully explain the symptoms that you get after um, stings from these plants. So in Australia, um, as I mentioned, we, we have a, a slightly different family of stinging nettles, the, the gimpy gimpy. Uh, two species that I'll be telling you about today in particular are the giant Australian stinging tree, or dendronite excelsa, and also the mulberry-leafed stinger, or um, dendronite moroides. So the giant Australian stinging tree, uh, as the name suggests, really is quite giant. It can grow up to 35, 40 metres tall. It's found... Um, right along the east coast, um, so the University of Queensland is located right about there, so you can just go in the hinterland, go for a bushwalk, um, and you'll see these beautiful trees. Most of the time you actually won't notice them unless you wander off the pass and you uh, come across a little sapling on the ground. Um, that's why these stingers are colloquially known as ankle biters, because um, they'll let you know when you come across one. Uh, the mulberry-leaved stinger um, is found more in the northern parts of, um, of Queensland and Australia. This particular one is a, a little one that, uh, well, it was in the lab prior to COVID and then it had to be relocated during lockdown. So I've placed it in front of the window at my house um, so that if any burglar was trying to come through the window, they would have a nice surprise. Um, so these ones are particularly notorious for causing extremely painful stings and they're also known as the suicide plant, so very um, ominous. Uh, so what does a gimpy gimpy sting actually feel like? If you look on the internet, um, you'll be informed that being stung is the worst kind of pain you can imagine. It's like being burnt with hot acid and electrocuted at the same time. <laughs> How that person arrived at that description, I don't know. If you really want to know what it feels like, you should ask David Anderson. Um, 
But it's certainly the symptoms can be severe enough that you get erection of these warning signs. So this is um, in a national park in, um, in Cairns in far north Queensland where visitors are advised that there's stinging trees um, in, in the forest and if you um, are exposed you should probably seek medical attention. Okay, so some actual um, evidence of what gimpy gimpy stings are really like. So um, Contact of the trichomes with skin causes an almost sort of immediate pricking and stinging pain, um, itching and piloerection. And so down the bottom here, you have a picture actually of my arm after an unfortunate gardening accident. Um, and at about 30 seconds, you can see that there's not, not much to see. Um, maybe a little bit of goosebumps, so that's piloerection. And then after a couple of minutes, you get um, sort of what's a classical histamine response, a wheel. Um, and this is then accompanied by development of, um, of a flare. So this is really um, local vasodilation um, arising probably from activation of peripheral nerve terminals that release um, vasodilatory um, neurotransmitters, peptides. The, um, the interesting thing about gimpy gimpy stings is really... Uh, of course, the severity of it, but also how long-lasting it is. So, on the on the far right, you can see an image of taken with a thermal camera, um, where this local vasodilation is still um, very much evident, um, even that three hours after the sting. And from personal experience, I can tell you that the, the pain lasts for at least eight to twelve hours, and um, quite often weeks and sometimes months. Um, the, it feels quite interesting, really, a sort of a pricking, burning pain. You also get these crawling and shooting um, aches. Um, the pain can radiate to you, auxiliary lymph nodes. And so it's really um, very weird and wonderful. And so these weird and wonderful symptoms um, are actually what motivated me originally to, to try and understand what might be causing um, these symptoms. Um, so in collaboration with Tom Durek at the University of Queensland, we thought we'll just go a really old-fashioned approach, um, just a, an activity-guided fractionation. Uh, and so what we did is we collected the stinging hair extract from um, gimpy gimpy leaves and uh, used HPLC to, to separate, um, let's call it the venom. Um, and on the, on the right-hand side here in the black, you can see that the stinging hair uh, um, liquid is actually quite complex, so um, it's, it contains a number of um, molecules. And then in, in the red, um, what you can see is the um, nose offensive behaviours of um, mice that were injected with each of the fraction of the um, uh into the foot pad. And so you'll appreciate that um, there was really only one fraction, uh, which is this very late eluting fraction here, that caused um, pain-like behaviours like poor licking, um, lifting and, and flinching. Um, and mouldy mass spectrometry showed that this fraction was actually dominated by uh, molecules in approximately the 4 kilo Dalton range. Uh, we then did a triptych digest, um, MSMS sequencing and a transcriptomic analysis, so this is you know, a lot of work summarised in half a sentence, um, and ultimately we identified that this pain-causing fraction contained a family of 36 amino acid peptides, that had um, uh, six cysteines or, or three disulfide bonds. And in homage to the um, indigenous name of the stinging nettle, we, we called them the, um, the gimpy tides. And just um, to orient you for the remainder of the talk, peptides derived from dendronite excelsa um, had the prefix EXTX for excelsa toxin, and peptides derived from dendronite moroides had the um, prefix uh, MOTOX or um, MOTOX for moroidotoxin. Now, the interesting thing about these peptides uh, was that they actually had uh, basically no similarity to any known peptide sequences we'd, we'd seen previously. Um, in fact, the most closely related um, peptides are these plant-derived um, uh, insulin um, uh, peptides, so leg insulin, and also PA1B, but really the, the sequence similarity wasn't that high. The one uh, fact that stood out about these peptides is, um, as we've heard earlier, the, the cysteine spacing, which was quite rem reminiscent of uh, the cysteine arrangement that you can see in animal venom-derived peptides um, and that are so-called cysteine, not peptides. Uh, so um, it was a little bit unusual to find uh, cysteine, not peptides, in, in these plants, um, but you can clearly appreciate from the NMR structure of excelsa toxin on the left um, that indeed this seems to be uh, really similar to an inhibitory cysteine knot or a knot-in structure. 
Um, so in the yellow, you've got the um, disulfite bonds. And on the right-hand side here, you've got Huen toxin 4, which is actually a sodium channel inhibitor found in spider venom. And even if you're not a peptide person, you'll appreciate that the arrangement of the disulfite bonds and also the loops um, is quite similar between Huen toxin and excelsa toxin. And so really, this was the first um, inhibitory cysteine not or not in from, from a plant that we um, described. So we were curious to uh, know whether these gimpitides truly are the pain-causing principle of the gimpy gimpy, and um, the approach we took was to produce the peptide synthetically. Um, and then we turned back to our in vivo assay, so we injected um, various concentrations of excelsitoxin and motoxin using an intraplantar injection, so that's um, a, a subcutaneous injection in the foot pad. Um, and what you can see on the left-hand side is that excelsitoxin, so that's um, in the blues and the greens, and also motoxin in the orange, um, clearly caused a, um, a dose-dependent um, pain-like behaviours. So this is a very complicated assay. You have uh, a student, a timer, and a clicker, and each pore lift and, and lick is, um, is, is counted. And so you can appreciate that... Um, in intraplantar injection of these toxins um, causes quite profound and long-lasting um, pain symptoms. Um, perhaps interestingly, uh, on the right, you can also see that these toxins also increase the local skin temperature. So um, in the green, you've got the injected hind pore, and you can clearly see that the skin temperature is increased after administration. And perhaps more strikingly in the little inset, you can see that the left paw of this mouse is clearly a lot warmer than the uninjected um, right paw. And so this is very similar to what you see after accidental or otherwise um, encounters with the, with the actual stinging plant. So we wanted to know what these gimpy tights do, and to understand that in a bit more detail, we turned to calcium imaging in dissociated dorsal root ganglion neurons. Um, so uh, they're um, uh, dissociated DRG neurons uh, loaded with a fluorescent calcium dye. Um, and what you can appreciate um, here is that uh, administration of excelsior toxin uh, caused an increase in intracellular calcium in um, a, a large number of DRGs. And um, they were defined by sensitivity to capsaicin and depolarization with potassium chloride. On the other hand, the non-excitable cells um, contained in these DRG cultures um, did not respond to excelsior toxin. And so this seemed to be really um, a sensory neuron-specific um, toxin. So next we turn to manual patch clamp recordings in um, dissociated DRGs to try and understand a little bit more what might be going on. And what we found was that excelsior toxin inhibits inactivation of voltage-gated inward current. So uh, this is an example of the sort of current we uh, recorded. So in the, uh, in the black, you've got the control current. And you can clearly see that exposure to excelsior toxin in the green um, inhibits inactivation of um, this current. And this, um, this was observed in um, just about all of the DRGs we patched. A clue to the pharmacology of these toxins came from the experiment on the right, where, um, so here we've plotted the um, persistent current component. So again, you can see that the toxin um, causes a persistent current, um, and that current was um, reduced both when we replaced extracellular sodium, um, and importantly, it was also almost completely abolished in the presence of tetrodotoxin, which is, of course, a voltage-gated sodium channel blocker. So these experiments suggest that, that these toxins um, might be acting similarly to animal venom-derived toxins that inhibit inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels. Unfortunately, manually patching DRGs is slow and tedious. So in order to understand what these toxins do in a little bit more detail, we also turn to TE671 um, uh, cells that express NAF1.7, and we used um, automated patch clamp recording to, um, to define the uh, the pharmacology of these toxins in a bit more detail. Um, so on the left-hand side here, you can have um, a current in the presence of excelsior toxin, and in the middle you've got motoxin, and it's quite clear that just like the DRGs in these TE671 cells, um, the plant-derived toxins inhibit inactivation of this endogenous, endogenous um, voltage-gated sodium current. I also wanted to point out on the right-hand side here the um, sodium... Um, channel response to a scorpion venom-derived toxin called OD1. 
Um, and so you can appreciate that OD1, just like the plant-derived toxin, also inhibits um, inactivation of the sodium channel. So this is really an example of convergent evolution where both the plants and the scorpion um, have evolved very similar um, pharmacological effects um, uh, on, on the sodium channels. Looking in a bit more detail at the um, effects of excelsitoxin and motoxin on sodium channels, um, we showed that excelsitoxin and motoxin both shift voltage dependence of activation um, to more hyperpolarized potentials, and they also um, <coughs> shift um, the voltage dependence of inactivation. So clearly this is then consistent with the enhanced excitability um, that we see in vivo and also um, in neurons. Um, I didn't explain it in too much detail, but there is anecdotal reports that uh, dendronite excelsa, so the North Queensland species, causes pain that's a lot worse than the, um, the South Queensland one. And consistent with those reports, we observed that um, morodotoxin is about tenfold more potent than excelsa toxin. So um, you can see that in the concentration response curves um, on the bottom here. Interestingly, the um, plant-derived PA1B, which I mentioned earlier, actually um, had no effect up to a concentration of 300 nanomolar. So even though they're the most closely related peptides, they don't seem to have the same pharmacology. Um, the other interesting observation we made that is that um, these toxins are, are very, very sticky. Um, so this is a, um, a, a sample trace from a cell exposed to excelsitoxin, and you can see that even after 30 minutes of washing, there is no recovery of... Um, the inactivation, and so this, this persistent effect might explain the, the very long-lasting in vivo effects that we see. So we were then curious to know whether these gimpitides are unique to Australia, because as everybody knows, Australia does everything that's venomous bigger and better, uh, or might they also be found in other stinging nettle species? And so uh, postdoc in, in my group, Sam Robinson, convinced me that the next best thing to Australia is New Zealand, and we should look at Urtica ferox. Um, so that's what we did then. So we turned to um, the onga onga, uh, which is also renowned for causing extremely painful stings. In severe cases, it can actually cause uh, systemic symptoms, including, um, for example, example, neuromuscular and respiratory distress, weakness, and hypersalivation. Um, just like other nettle species, the onga onga has been reported to contain histamine, 5-HT, and acetylcholine. But again, we thought perhaps there's a little bit more to, um, to this nettle as well. So just like for the gimpy, gimpy we turn to an activity-guided fractionation assay. Um, again, you can see that the onga onga also has um, quite complex um, uh, trichome fluid. Um, in this instance, the pain-causing activity in yellow here was distributed over a number of fractions, actually. And so subfractionation really identified two bioactive components. Um, the first one was fraction 12.12. .12, um, which contained a molecule with a, a molecular mass of about 4.3 uh, kilodaltons. Uh, and the second one was fraction 12.6, which um, contained a molecule um, with about 6.7 kilodaltons. So we thought, well, OK, fraction 12.12, .12, that at least the mass is pretty similar to the gimpy tights. Um, this one, well, no idea, but we thought we'd just find out the same way that we did with uh, the gimpy type. So again, we turned to uh, calcium imaging and dissociated DRG neurons. And, and here what we found was that um, fraction 12.12, .12, so the 4.3 kilodalton uh, peptide that we thought might be similar to the gimpy types, um, actually caused uh, um, cell lysis. So it activated both neuronal and non-neuronal cells. And on the right-hand side, um, you can see that you actually get dye leakage um, out of the cell after uh, toxin exposure, and that's really quite characteristic of poor-forming toxins. Um, a sequencing in MS, uh, MS revealed that uh, this peptide, or this, this fraction, is actually a 42 amino acid peptide that has high sequence similarity to um, a family of peptides known as viscotoxins and fluorotoxins. Um, and these are, are, are well-known uh, poor-forming toxins. Um, so we termed this, termed this peptide a uh, delta-othionine UF1A, and it probably causes pain by basically punching holes in the membranes of sensory neurons. Um, synthetic uh, UF1A 
um, as expected, causes um, nose offensive or pain, pain-like responses. So again, this is um, a, a pain behaviour assay where we administer the peptide by intraplantar injection. And again, you can see that you get um, you know, poor lifting and, and flinching. Um, and uh, what I'm not showing here is that um, this peptide also causes um, cell death in vitro. So that's really consistent with pharmacology as a, a poor forming toxin. Uh, on the other hand, SUP fraction 12.6, so you'll remember this has a mass of 6.7 kilodalton. Um, this peptide was interesting because it behaved very much like the gimpitides, so it activated only neuron neuronal cells but not non-neuronal cells. Um, and the responses in the DRG neurons was actually also blocked by tetrodotoxin. Uh, I should point out that the mass was really um, sort of not consistent with what we would have expected. Um, so the activity of um, this peptide was remini reminiscent of the gimpitide pharmacology, but the, the mass was inconsistent. Um, and when we uh, sequenced uh, uh, this, this fraction, we found that um, it's a, a 63 amino acid peptide that has basically no similarity to anything that we've seen previously. Um, it has a, a, a staggering number of um, cysteines, so... Um, probably six disulfide um, bonds, and this one we called um, a beta-delta ergica toxin, UF2A. So consistent with the effect on DRGs, we thought that um, uh, UF2A might also be a sodium channel modulator, and again, using automated patch clamp electrophysiology, uh, we looked at um, responses on um, voltage-gated sodium channels, so um, we assessed NAF 1.6, 1.7, and 1.8, um, and you can see that uh, UF2A caused, very similar to the gimpitides, um, inhibition of inactivation in um, TDX-sensitive um, subtypes, so 1.6 and 1.7, um, but it had no effect on the TDX-resistant subtype um, 1.8. Uh, and just like the other peptides, when we um, administered uh, this peptide in vivo, we also observed um, pain-like uh, responses. So we're, we're pretty certain that um, both UF 2A and U1A uh, contribute to the, uh, the pain-causing effects of um, onga onga. Um, so in summary, uh, today I've shown you that the gimpitides are a new class of plant-derived neurotoxic peptides. Uh, they act by impairing inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels to cause pain. Um, at the moment, they appear to be unique to the Australian nettle branch, although we're also starting to look at um, a different nettle species found across the world. Um, onga onga and other members of the urtica family, on the other hand, um, appear to be causing pain through multiple mechanisms that involve um, impairing inactivation of sodium channels and also by um, containing cytolytic toxins. And so hopefully I have convinced you that um, stinging, families, stinging plants have evolved multiple families of pain-causing to toxins and that they're actually venomous plants. So um, I'll finish by um, thanking... Uh, some of the key people who've contributed to this work, um, which um, is predominantly Tom Durek and um, Ed Gilding from UQ, um, uh, Sam, Sam Robinson, um, and also members of, of my group. And um, most, most of this work was actually done with um, a very valued member of the lab, um, Patrick the Patrick, which I'm sure every Patrick is called Patrick. But there you go. So thank you very much, and hopefully I've left enough time for some questions. That was a great talk. Um, do we have some questions, please? No? Okay. No, I'm surprised. Yeah. Oh, no, Derek. <laughs> cool. Hi. That was great. And do you know any where... Uh, uh, any position that on the sodium channel where this thing is binding? You mentioned how it looked very similar to OD1, whether it's binding, in fact, to the, the OD1 site, for example. One could almost suspect that I planted that question. Um, I'll start from the back. Um, we took advantage of the selectivity of UF2A um, over 1.8, and we made some chimeras. UF2A um, binds to the S3, S4 loop of domain 4. Um... The gimpy types are different. Um, so I haven't shown the data today, but we think that they bind to um, an accessory protein directly. 
um, how they interact with the sodium channel, then we haven't determined yet. Um, but given the effect on inactivation, we suspect it's most likely through domain four in, in some way, shape or form. But yeah, we're not sure. Did you have a question, Derek? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, okay, please. You don't have to ask questions. <laughs> In fact, Tony asked my original question, but I have another question for you because of what you mentioned. So I think the gibbetides, the way they work, it, it, they're doing something much more complicated to inactivation than, than maybe, maybe it sounds like you think that. So I should talk to you afterwards. But I think there's something else going on other than just slowing inactivation. Yes. Right. Yes, there is. Uh, yes. yes. inactivation from the open state looks like it's the same. It's yeah, the, I mean, the steady state. Um, inactivation looks different. Um, yeah, yes, look, uh, it's, you see it? uh, and, and if I should, I could have shown more extreme examples, but it's yeah, it's not just slowing inactivation. It's yeah, but the the inactivation from the open state looks identical, so it's not changed. Yes, it's the steady state response has changed. Yes, yeah. So, so there's, there's something funky going on. I think we can confidently summarise the pharmacology of these peptides as funky, yeah. and um, and I think we should yeah what I mean watch this space. Um, I think it's quite a unique mechanism of action. Yeah, I think yeah. it has to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David. <laughs> David Beach from Leeds. Really nice work. Thank you. I'm just thinking that we're actually trying to prevent pain, not cause pain. So I'm just, as you say, there may be a unique mechanism of action. Do, do you think you might be able to switch this to find inhibitors? Um, is that your yeah. you name? Know? That, that is obviously something that you would always tell granting agencies. Um, I definitely... So the way the gimpitides work, I'm quite hopeful at least, I don't want to say confident, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to dissociate binding from activation or inhibiting inactivation or whatever it does. Um, so, so yes, I think it might be, it might be possible. <laughs> um, obviously, we've also done work with you know, uh, making divalent peptides and conjugating them. So the, the, idea, the idea that you could convert something that's such a long-lasting pain-causing toxin into something that's analgesic is quite intriguing. Um, and definitely something that's worth exploring. So we'll have a couple of ideas, but we need to understand a bit better how they actually interact with the channel before we can confidently do that. Do, do the, the toxins, oh, not the toxins, but the if you touch the plant, do you get like a nature response as well? Um, Poison ivy type thing? Yes. Occasionally it's... Actually, occasionally... So what happens is that... Um, when you get stung, it hurts for quite a long time, a few hours, and then it goes away. And then most of the time, the next day or a week later, you sort of absentmindedly scratch the area and then the pain flares up again. So, yes, it does cause itch, but it's not, it's not a very severe itch. It's sort of it's very subtle. I was just thinking of maybe trip channels like histamine um, um, response and activating trip channels. Or uh, yes, I have not excluded activity at other channels. Um, in fact, I suspect that the gimpy tides may also at least also modulate um, water-scattered potassium channels, but yeah, we've only just started to look at that. So um, I would not be surprised if there was functional promiscuity. Okay. Okay. okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Thank you. Uh, Irina. <laughs>